So our gospel reading today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. And I'm going to be reading from the NIV translation, which might be different than the Bibles that are in the pews. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them, and in their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. And when they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But the apostles did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb, and bending over he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. This is the word of God for the people of God, and we can say, thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? God, as we gather, open our eyes to the empty tomb, to the linen that you have left behind, and to the life that leads you on. Draw us into that life, God, that we might be for the world the body of Christ, alive in grace and truth and love into eternity. Inspire in us, God, this day, by your Spirit, Easter lives. In your name we pray. Amen. While I can enjoy winter for a little bit, I am very excited that spring is finally starting to make its debut in the area, especially as someone who moved from a warmer climate up here. The blossoms, the sunshine, the abnormally active robins that keep skipping across my front yard. And, you know, robins are in this season where they're, they're beginning to mate. They're beginning to, to find a partner and lay eggs. And so I think about all the families, as, as maybe some of you did when you were young, who will find that precious surprise at some point this spring. A nest in a tree or in a bush by your house where three or four little blue eggs will be laid. I can remember as a child going to my grandparents' house and seeing what, what, where the birds had laid certain eggs and watching them hatch and grow. I wonder if anyone here has had that experience of witnessing that, those robin eggs and then those robin chicks coming forth into the world. The ritual of spying on the same nest every day, expectantly waiting to hear their, their not so wondrous cries at first, but then one day to find the nest empty. I'm reminded of the story of, of, a, of a, a father and daughter where one day the father comes running in saying, Dad, Dad, the, the nest is empty. And so they, they run back outside and they see the empty nest and stood by the bush for a moment. And, and of course, the father is, is a realist, so he has a moment where he wonders what happens to the baby birds. Perhaps in their neighborhood, a cat got a hold of them, or maybe the hawk that he saw a few days ago was able to snatch them out of the nest. And he stands there wondering and thinking at all that could have happened, and he fails to notice his daughter looking up, standing in place, looking at the sky. And finally, he notices her, and he asks, honey, what, what are you doing? And she replies, I'm trying to see if I can find the baby birds flying around. And then there's a pause, and she says, maybe they flew away somewhere else. And the father decided that he would accept his daughter's hypothesis as correct to allow himself to embrace what Father Gregory Boyle would call terror melting into wonder and slipping into peace. 
Those last words of terror melting into wonder and then slipping into peace. They capture for me and I think for us the reaction of the women as they come to the tomb to look for Jesus this morning. Terror at where is his body. These women who have faithfully and risking their lives come to finish burying Jesus find an empty tomb. Who took Jesus' body and robbed them of the opportunity to honor their rabbi? Are the Romans extending their cruelty? Has Good Friday spilled into Easter? And for a moment, they're caught in the mentality of the tomb. Dead bodies don't rise, they must think. Despite the lessons that Jesus taught, despite the promises he made, they can only imagine the terror of what an empty grave could mean. Someone has exhumed the body and disgraced his resting place. But their terror gives way to wonder. In remembering his words, they're filled with wonder and return to share this wonder with the disciples. It doesn't matter that in Luke they still haven't found the living body of Jesus. Jesus hasn't appeared to them in this gospel. The empty tomb given the word of Christ is enough to mean that the resurrection is real. The terror of Good Friday is gone. What remains is resurrected joy. Now, I'm not one to second-guess Jesus. But it occurs to me that this whole resurrection thing would have been a lot easier to prove if he had just stayed put. If he had just sat down in the tomb and waited for them to come. Or like we get in the Gospel of John, if he would have at least stayed in the garden. Why in Luke and Mark and Matthew do we get this tomb and Jesus is missing? Rather than getting the living body of Christ. Perhaps faith is seeing the empty tomb. And allowing it to mean that new and wonderful thing. The disciples hear about this empty tomb. And they're trapped in the death that it signifies. They're trapped in the tomb mentality. But women, but the women and Peter see the empty tomb. And they see not just life. But the redeemed reality that Christ is ushering in. The tomb can mean something more than a dead end to them. It can mean the life of Christ spreading out again in the world. And this time eternally and unstoppably. The faith of the women redefines the tomb from terror to wonder. Easter invites us to believe in the absence of death, of sin, of evil, and to search for how God wants to recreate tombs in our lives. The empty tomb is no longer the sign of the horror, but the promise that death will be defeated in all its forms, and we can join Jesus on the road proclaiming that promise using words if we must. The empty tomb is full of possibilities. Will we be trapped by it, contained by it, or will we be propelled by it beyond that moment into the future that Christ is leading us to? What traps in our life is Christ emptying with redemptive power? Where Good Friday saw the tomb of addiction or pain, Easter promises recovery and new life. Where Good Friday sees a tomb of animosity or hatred, Easter promises promises us redeemed love for one another. Where Good Friday sees a dead end, Easter promises the open road to Emmaus and into eternity. Easter doesn't forget the tomb, but it knows that an empty tomb invites us into a reality that can take seriously what happened and promises something new that can and will be. It doesn't ignore Good Friday, but it sees the effects of Good Friday as temporary, done away with. Instead, we are invited to join the uncontainable, resurrected life. And so, my first question is, what tombs do we believe the church is being called to join Christ in emptying this season? What Good Fridays are we called to join in pointing to Easter? But I'd also like to ask the provocation in verse 5. Why do you search for the living amongst the dead? Perhaps the difference between the women who see the tomb empty in wonder and the disciples who hear about it in doubt is their commitment to the tomb itself rather than the person who has left it. Their desire for the tomb, the surety of the tomb, rather than the unpredictable resurrected one who's off somewhere on the road talking with strangers. 
to the form rather than the content of Easter. Last year, I tried my hand at growing squash in garden boxes. Some of you helped me with that because I do not have a green thumb. And once I got my plants into the boxes, everything went great. They, they started growing like crazy. They took off, and I was eating squash twice a day and giving some of it away. I probably should have planted something else. It was a success, and I kept wrapping the vines around to keep them in those neat little garden boxes, and they kept filling the box, and then pretty soon they outgrew the box, and the squash was spilling over the sides and hanging on the edge of the box that I had, had committed them to. So what was I supposed to do? They needed to stay in the box that I had made for them, so I, I took the vines and put them back in and wrapped them around again, and, and not long after, they popped right back out. And here's the thing. Even though those vines had left their protected little garden box, even though they had spilled out of the space I had set for them, they remained healthy for a time. So why was I so committed to that box? They still gave me squash that I could eat. Life could still flourish outside of the box that I was trying to force my plants to stay in. Friends, Jesus does not stick around in the tomb but the next story is him on the open road to Emmaus talking to those two disciples. Let the disciples follow the resurrected body, not stay to marvel too long at an empty tomb. What if Luke's depiction of Jesus' resurrection, considering Luke, we believe, also wrote the book of Acts, is also a depiction of how the Spirit wants to work through the church outside of the tomb, outside of the box that we feel so content staying in, in the places we won't look, living instead of staying put? What if the promise of the empty tomb is that we are free to be outside of the ordinary, to see resurrection in new places if the church is going to live into the Easter promise, we must follow Jesus out of the box onto the, un onto the unexpected paths with new people and new places and new experiences because we have the confidence of evil and death defeated in a living Christ. The church can make things empty tombs. We can get hung up and gawking at them, at the things that have always kept us contained. But Easter means that we leave the tomb to go find Christ on the unexpected road. And the resurrection promises us that Christ's life will be there precisely in the unexpected places. That nothing can contain the overflowing, uncontainable, uncontrollable life of Christ. And we are given the courage to chase after it. Christ has risen. The tomb is empty. So let us step out today in the courage of life everlasting to witness to, to find a resurrected Savior who is in new and unexpected places. Why should we look for the living amongst the dead? Why should we look for our Savior in the box? He's out in the midst of the world amongst our neighbors, begging us to witness to the defeat of death and the life everlasting in whatever way possible and use words if necessary. Would you pray with me? Christ, we gather today to witness to life, to the end of death and sin, and yet we know that there are still tombs in our world. Call us outside of ourselves, God, by your Holy Spirit. Call us on the road to those who need to hear, who need to experience life in your love and grace. Free us from the burdens that death tries to place upon us so we might live and live in abundance with you forevermore. Amen. I wanted to share this poem by Ted Loder, who wrote this wonderful book of poems and, and prayers. We read one of his poems last year as well. It's called Help Me Unbury Wonder. O oh God of the miracles, of galaxies and crocuses and children, I praise you now for the soul of the child within me. Shy in my awe, delighted by my foolishness, stubborn in my wanting, persistent in my questioning, and bold in my asking you to help me unbury my wonder. 
my wonder for life and humor and gratitude, so I may invest them eagerly in the recurring mysteries of spring and beginnings, of willows that weep and rivers that flow and people who grow in such endlessly amazing and unexpected ways that I will be forever linked and loyal to justice and joy, simplicity and humanity, to Christ and his kingdom. Amen.